how can we not get sucked into this how can we not be swayed by these pendulums like what's the what's the little tip and strategy that um vadim talks about yeah so there's basically three ways to beat a pendulum so to speak right like you can just basically step aside and uh and there's a distinction here between ig ignorance and uh you know avoidance right like you want to basically just let it slip through don't be reactive to it welcome to the prime life project podcast place to help you unlock your full potential both mentally and physically to become the best version of you welcome back to an episode of the prime Life project podcast i'm your host daniel james and today i am extremely delighted to welcome back an old friend of the podcast not just of the podcast but of myself personally uh this gentleman first came on the show in episode 70 can you believe and it was mine and mikey's first ever meeting doing a podcast so it's the first ever video podcast we did on youtube it was this man that came in and since then me and him have stayed connected we may not speak as much as we'd like to but every time we talk it's like we've never been away from each other. Uh, the value that you added on the episode was absolutely fantastic. I went back and re-listened to it. So although what we're going to talk about today is very, very different, I do strongly recommend you go and check out episode number 70, where my guest talks about finding your purpose. And I promise you, it's nothing like you will have heard before. So go and check that out. I'm also not going to give a big, long intro to this guest. If you want to hear more about him, go and check out that episode. However, I would like to welcome back to the podcast, Mr. Owen Hunt, a.k.a. Boatsy. Boatsy? Is it Boatsy or Bootsy? <laughs> yeah, that's Boatsy. right. Bootsy. 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 Yeah. Bootsy. Bootsy Greenwood. How are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm doing very well, Daniel. Thank you so much for having me back. And uh, it's a it's a pleasure and an honor, as always, man. Because for me, like I, I know you was Owen now. And I think I remember on the first episode, I said how disappointed I was when I found out that Bootsy wasn't your real name. And I then also realized <laughs> that for, for YouTube algorithms and trackability, like you're known as Bootsy, so I need to call you Bootsy and it's going to go in as Bootsy. However, Owen, Bootsy, whatever, whatever we call ourselves. Um, anyway, how have we been since last spoke? Been all good? Man, uh, so good. So many things have happened since then. And uh, it's just been great to stay in touch. I really enjoyed our conversations that we had in the Nebuchadnezzar with Paul. And, oh. uh, <laughs> so, so, so again, for, for, we had the, the other guests who are Paul Cope. So me, Paul, and I were in a group together called the Nebuchadnezzar, where we just used to just talk about some crazy stuff. And <laughs> I wanted to bring Owen back on because... Recently, Owen's sort of resurfaced back on YouTube. Again, he's, he's a comedian, does all this stuff, but he's resurfaced back on YouTube, which is where I originally found him. And he's talking about a book called Reality Transurfing. So if you are watching this on video, uh, you will see the book I'm holding in my hand. It's basically about a thousand pages. It's a massive, huge book. It is a book that really helped me start off on my journey. And this is how me and Owen originally connected because Owen was doing some summaries of this. And that's why I originally brought him on the podcast to talk about. However, we got excited, we went off on tangents. So I brought him back today to actually talk about this topic because it's so, so good. And I promise you, the topics we've covered today potentially will change your life if you dedicate some time to really understanding what me and Owen are going to dive into. So, Owen, um, for those of you, for those, for those of you, for those people that are new to reality transurfing, how would you briefly describe the main principles or teaching of this book? Well, that is a tough question with a 900 page book, but I think I can, I think I can take a, a stab at it for sure. Um, <clears throat> it's a different book. Uh, it, it's definitely a, a spiritual type of book, but I think it's much less spiritual than many of the other, I would say models of reality that exist out there. I don't think there's a single book that can really explain what reality is. I don't think there's a single person on the planet that can explain what reality is, but that particular book that you are holding in your hand right there is the closest that I've ever come across. And uh, basically the idea of the book and the model is to be able to create the life that you want for yourself. And it goes through a very detailed process of some of the obstacles that you're going to find and what, what specifically technique wise, uh, that you can do in order to get yourself to a place that you're, let's say, happy, you know, that, that, that you are on a path toward a goal and feeling fulfilled and settled in your life. Now, it's not about meditation. It's not about changing yourself. It's really about returning to yourself and understanding who you are at a deep heart level, like who you really are. And it and it, and it really does a great job of redefining or reiterating a lot of the esoteric principles that are found in other books. 
he has his own vernacular that you got to kind of surf for lack of a better way to say it. Like, it's, it's a Russian book, isn't it? It's a Russian book that then got yep. translated into English. So yep. that's also part of it as well. So sometimes you kind of got to just pause, sit with what's been said and kind of read between the lines almost or something, haven't you? Yeah. And there's a lot of nuance to it. So it's not like he's just introducing these principles. He's going into grave detail about how they work. So it's not just like, Hey, here's this idea. It's like, here's this idea. Here's how it works in a meta sense. Here's how it works in a micro sense. You know, here are all these, and it's beautiful the way that it's laid out. You know, the art, the, the author does not claim that it's his knowledge he actually gets the knowledge from a dream and an overseer in a garden in his dream who tells him that he can have, so he's like hanging out with this old grumpy man. And I understand why these old spiritual men are grumpy now. I didn't get it at the time, the first time I read it, you know, but he's hanging, he's like, oh yeah, you know, he's, he's talking to this uh, overseer of the place. And the overseer says, well, you could live here too, if you wanted to. And then Vadim begins to argue with him. And then Vadim realizes, oh, Shit, I'm in a dream. I, 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 it's useless to have an argument with a character in my dream. But when he wakes up, he feels like he's been imparted some knowledge and he just hears the word transurfing. And so that's the beginning, the open of the book. He goes back to like when he was a smoker and when he was like really kind of had a drab, a distaste for his life and reality and the, the setting that he was found himself in. And he, tells you where he was and then compares that to where he is since finding and discovering the model. But he says himself that it's ancient knowledge. It doesn't belong to anyone. And his sort of set of vernacular is just a little bit different than you're going to hear. It's a different angle. Mm. You know? So what and makes it different? Because like the, the, you've got like the law of attraction and you've got the secret and you've got all these kind of books because we're talking about like spiritual texts. They're the ones that most mainstream people will go to. So what kind of makes this book different to something like, let's say, The Secret? Yeah, the contrast is really one of the biggest things about it that makes it different. He talks about, like, the Law of Attraction talks about how to get what you want, but Vadim talks about why you always get what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of it. So, you know, when we talk about magic and all these different things and timelines and yada, 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 it kind of sets up this kind of strange idea in people's minds that's not... I don't think it's very practical or usable, but when we think about the idea, the mathematical certainty that is infinity, and he calls wherever infinity is outside of our physical reality, let's say it also contains it, the alternative space. So everything that ever is, was, or will be that already exists. So that takes a lot of pressure off, right? Like if you're trying to manifest your destiny, well, you're trying to conjure this thing up and use magic and all of this. If you just take a step back and take a deep breath and realize, hey, my destiny already exists in the mind of the all, in the metaphysical space, in the Akashic records, whatever fancy thing we want to put on there, it's if it's infinity ultimately. Because so that the, takes that, 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 that's the thing is, so, so, I do interrupt you there, but that's so people heard the, hear the word infinity, essentially. Again, um, universal mind, uh, Ash Ashra records you mentioned that there's, there's so many different words for it. And I think this is also the problem that's confusing with spirituality and spiritual texts. And again, for, for people listening to this, when we talk about spirituality, just to get a definition, like my version of spirituality is the, the unseen. It's trying to understand the unseen. That's essentially what this is. Because people hear spirituality and think it's all hippie and woo-woo. But for me, even something like gravity is spiritual by nature, which is something you can't see, but you can see expressions of it if that makes sense. So that's my definition. I'm not sure if you've got another working definition, but just for the listeners here, I'm talking about spiritual stuff. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And I feel like the problem with it, like most things, is that there's a lot of information that contradicts itself and it contradicts itself because they use different words. So people get confused, even myself. Like I said, I've spent thousands and thousands of pounds in mentorship groups trying to understand this stuff. And you think you've got one model, you go read another book and you're thinking, what? And then you realize, oh, oh, because this word means this. Right, why don't we just have a universal word for this one thing? Why can't we just agree on a word? So if you wanted to, to put them to about you, it, so infinity, just to clarify, what we're talking about there, infinity is the universal mind, the, the energy, that's energy field around us. Is that essentially what we're talking about? Absolutely. And this might be really helpful too to people because I didn't realize this until I read the book. It's also synonymous with the dream space. Mm -hmm. So when you, go to, when you go to sleep every night, you're, you're basically, your mind is shut off 
and the spirit part of you or the heart of you is flying through the Akashic records, the metaphysical, the alternative space, the whatever you call it, right? And the dream space is essentially, it's the same thing as, uh, as all of those other, you know, defined concepts of infinity. Mm. So what, your heart is kind of like a kinky little freak. <laughs> it wants what it wants, man, you know, and you hear people say that that's a very true statement. And what happens to a lot of us is we, we live in our minds because of the way we live in, in our inert reality. And so the heart gets the chance to come into this reality and live in this material world and get what it wants in this incarnation, let's say. And it needs the cooperation of the mind in order to be able to do that. But when we're in the dream space, like everything just boom, boom, boom. If you've ever had a lucid dream or if anybody has ever become aware that they were dreaming in a dream, then you realize, oh, I can do anything I want. This is incredible. And you can, and you can do it immediately. But there's no delay in the dream space. However, there is a delay in the meta in the in the in the material world. There is. It's so dense and inert here. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the differentiation. So there's two worlds: one shared physical reality and the metaphysical or inf infinite or alternative space or akashic records. Those are all synonymous dream space, and that is encapsulating of infinity. But we're all here sharing this material world. So what we want to learn how to do and what the book is kind of teaching us to do is to take whatever exists in that metaphysical world, in the Akashic records, the infinity, and bring it into the materialization of this particular reality. Mm. The first metaphor he uses is water going through a pipe. And it took me years to understand this metaphor. So break, it down, so break it down. And more, so, so with this, like, again, we can get carried away with this. So I won't keep stopping every now and again. Um, yeah, it's good. And as simplistically as possible. Uh, can you explain this? Because like I said, it, it, I'm going to talk about your summary and stuff at the end. Like I'm going to big push on that. But can you explain this uh, as simplistically as possible for people? Because I think once people really start to understand some of the metaphors and stuff we're talking about here, I, I, I'm not exaggerating this. It will literally change your life. As I said to him beforehand, I've read this book once through fully, um, about three quarters of the way through the second time. And I've come back to it. And with all the other learning that I've done over the years, this book now makes more sense than it ever has done. So can we just explain this, this pipe thing we're talking about there? Absolutely. Yeah. So he's using the metaphor of a, a frozen water pipe and how water is flowing through the pipe and how on the edges of the pipe, because the outside of the pipe is frozen, pieces of the water are materializing into ice. So you can think of the water that's flowing through the pipe as what we've been talking about, these inf infinite possibilities, everything that is, was, or ever will be kind of flowing through this pipe. But whenever it touches the outer ring that's frozen, those pieces materialize into small ice crystals. So they become material now. So basically he's using that model as a metaphor to say, look, there's infinite possibilities, all these different things that are coming through that are possible throughout your life. And if you can learn how to choose is how he says it. You don't hope, you don't, you don't pray, you don't wish you intend and intention is the word mm -hmm. for this, for this book and for this model, then you can learn to crystallize those possibilities from the water into ice. If that makes sense. Absolutely. We're going to talk about the intention. So we're going to very, like, I want to talk very, very broadly. And then as we're going through this episode again, it's just sort of like really um, finer details so people can really understand some of these principles. Um, what would you say is some of the most counterintuitive uh, aspects of this book? that new people might struggle the most to grasp because there's a lot. It is a lot. I love your definition of spirituality because it's the things that we can't see, but we see the evidence of those things. So I would say the idea of pendulums is maybe one of those things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we look back a couple of years, we can see mass formation psychosis. So let's pause there. Let's skip it. Let's skip a question. Let's go into that. What are pendulums? Let's, let's, let's okay. talk about pendulums because, because let's say before we sure. talk about everybody needs to kind of get an understanding. So, yeah, I agree with this completely. This is one of the biggest takeaways I got from this book. Uh, and then the more I understood about energy and vibrations, it all made sense. So what are pendulums? And then let's go into that. Okay, cool. So the way I like to explain pendulums is that every physical object also has a spiritual or metaphysical counterpart. So the best way to illustrate it is the idea of a group, really. Like if you are part of any group, it's going to have a set of rules. It's going to have uh, basically a culture that's created as part of being that group. And that oftentimes isn't even intentional. 
but we can kind of look at pendulums in a couple of different ways. I like to start with the more meta sort of way, the larger, uh, and then we can, we can talk about the, the macro and then we can talk about the micro. But if you think about a political party, if you think about a religion or a group of any kind, each and every one of those groups, when it's formed, it has an energy that is created a basically a, a set of rules that you must abide by as being part of that particular group. And that's what makes you a good member. Generally speaking, the, uh, the triggers for that are guilt, duty, and obligation. Mm. If you feel guilty, you'll do the thing that you need to do to be part of that group. If you have a certain obligation uh, to it, then you're going to, you're going to comply with it. And the pendulum rule is to do as I do. But anytime several people get together and create anything at all, a pendulum is then formed. And that pendulum is the energetic equivalent of whatever was created. And it literally, it's anything. Look at branding, look at advertising, look at Ford Motor Company or McDonald's. Any of those things are themselves pendulums, energetic pendulums. And people who have some experience with the spiritual stuff, they may be familiar with the idea of egregores. Egregores are not unlike pendulums and they're just like more intentional things. But the idea again, is that everything already exists. So if you and I were like, we want to create a pendulum. So my podcast or your podcast, mm -hmm. it is that right? Like in the infinite space that already exists, but because of your choice, you light it up. Now that becomes its own energy. It has its own force, its own culture, its own identity. And then people start to see that you light that thing up from the water pipe, and then it crystallizes into material reality. Mm -hmm. Well, now that's a pendulum. So every political party, every every group under the sun, even being part of a gym, right? Like if you don't wipe down the machine at the gym, you're being a bad gym member. Mm -hmm. That's part of the pe pendulum. You know, it's just, that's that's how these things form and operate. Now, some are more formal. They have a set of guidelines, even written down. Others are just a group of, you know, even a crew or a gang of misfits. They have their own sort of set of standards or rules that you must obey to be a part of that group. And that's basically what a pendulum is on the, on the macro level. And then even on the most simplistic level, it can essentially be like, like you said, like the podcast, this podcast technically is a pendulum because it's mm -hmm. an energy thing that's going out there. And then the listeners, they are basically resonated with that energy and then have decided to give their energy to it. So is that, that makes sense. A so pendulums basically can either give and or take energy. So except for example, I think the analogy uses in the book, I think uh, for you talk about before, it's like sports teams. Mm -hmm. So when you're watching a sports team, you're giving that pendulum your energy. Yep. So when you're engaged in a pendulum, your energy is being given to that thing. And if it is a negative pendulum, then you will then have the negative repercussions of that, let's say. So if your football team loses, you feel negative. Yep. You have been influenced by that pendulum. And every single day we're influenced by pendulums and if we're not consciously aware of it, that can then knock us off course because energetically we're being pulled in different directions and we may not necessarily be aware of the pendulum's motive. Is that kind of a nice succinct summary of it? It's excellent. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's perfectly spot on. It's it's almost like, so uh, Paulo Suelo has this quote that's like, uh, whenever, whenever you set out to do something, I'm butchering it. <laughs> whenever you set out to do something, the universe conspires to help you. And I believe that. And also... Whenever you set out to do something, pendulums conspire against you to keep yes. you from doing it. So these are like energy sucks. Like really it's about keeping your energy, right? Like the more that you can keep your energy, that's the more energy that you have to do whatever your intention is to create the reality for yourself that you want to see. So by getting swept up in the sports team, such a great example, right? Like it, it's not something that isn't initially going to ruin someone's life. However, if you get completely obsessed with Michael Jordan, you're buying all his jer jerseys and the shoes and you don't, you start paying attention to your family as a result of being so obsessed with this thing, this pendulum, this thing that's outside of you has nothing to do with you, then it will strip and take every single part of your life and all of your energy away from you. If you aren't aware, if you don't, if you, if you let it. So I, I love the term mood hoovers and energy vampires. So my understanding of this is, for example, your partner could be a energy vampire, meaning basically a pendulum, a singular pendulum. I don't know if there's another word for it, but a, a, taking your energy. Again, not intentionally, but I'm sure we've all been there, male or female, been in a relationship that was just draining our energy, not good for us. Is my understanding then that if 
her family, in my situation, it was a woman, her family is negative as well. That then collective family mm. is then a pendulum. So that this family I'm potentially a part of is a pendulum. Is that a thing? So your family can potentially be a pendulum. Is that a thing or is that not a thing? Absolutely. It, it's it's crazy when you start to dissect this stuff because there he talks about it later in the book. There are literal pendulum networks where there are larger and larger sort of hierarchies of pendulums. And they're completely unavoidable because if we look in nature, like a school of fish is a pendulum. There's not one lead fish and everyone's keying off of that fish. They all move in unison. That's how they work. A, 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 a colony of ants. It's the same thing. This is just how nature works. So by gaining an insight into this, we can really start to be way more intentional in our lives and what we're giving our energy and attention to, because really all we are is attention anyway. So whenever we get kind of knocked off course into this rabbit hole or that one, this pendulum or that pendulum, you know, we are now giving energy to it as opposed to ourselves, which is ideally what we're going to want to do in order to create, you know, the best possible set of circumstances for ourselves. So I think that's the biggest thing. And we're going to talk about it when, we, when we get to the part about intention, something that I learned literally the end, tail end of last year, and it's made so much sense to me. Well, two things, the formula B times do equals have. I mean, if you want to have something, you have to become the person that can do the things that have the results. How do you become the person? Intention. So every morning when you wake up, you literally only have two choices, intention or distraction. And when you put it that simply, and this is basically what I help clients get to is a framework of this is where I want to go. And this is the person I want to be. And then when you're faced with a decision each day, you're asking yourself, is this moving me closer towards my goal? Yes or no? Is this helping me become the person I want to be? Yes or no? And then it helps you filter to be intentional about the life you're living. The problem is there's so many pendulums out there. There's so many energy things out there that we give our energy away so willingly that we wonder why we can't move our life forward and become a better version of ourselves because we're absolutely drained because we have no energy left. Like it is such a bizarre concept. So then now we've kind of freaked everyone out that there's these like energy vampires <laughs> and these pendulum pits out there. How can we not get sucked into this how can we not be swayed by these pendulums like what's the what's the little tip and strategy that um vadim talks about yeah so there's basically three ways to beat a pendulum so to speak right like you can just basically step aside and uh and there's a distinction here between ig ignorance and uh you know avoidance right like you want to basically just let it slip through. Don't be reactive to it. You know, when I say that uh, there's like a, a micro kind of thing, um, that's getting your initial energy. And every every sort of prod is what he calls it, like a prod of a pendulum, is 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 trying to get us to get suckered into more conflict. Every conflict seeks more conflict, right? Like it just wants to keep going and going and going. So the idea is to just let it pass through. Just be kind of stoic about it and not let it affect you. That's the first kind of thing that you can do. Another thing that you can do is uh, to act in an unexpected way that the pendulum will not receive your energy, right? Like if you get bad news, let's say, well, you celebrate that bad news or you make a joke about it. That's the third way that I really like is you just, you make a joke. Like you just, uh, and this is how, like it was my family was already disposed to this, but he calls it the vaudeville lifeline where you just, you just uh, make a, make it into something funny. And that dispels the energy, anything that you don't take completely seriously, anything that you even make a joke about, it doesn't have power over you. And that, that's the power of humor. And, uh, and so in, in, re in reality, transurfing, whenever these pendulums are going to knock us off course, cause they will, like, that's the whole point is like, it's trying to knock you off of balance. If you're like, set and aimed, like you're saying in your intention to go this place, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be. And this is, you know, this is what I'm going to have and, and who I am now you've, you've made that choice. It's already made. So now that's the big idea of transurfing is you have chosen and that's over. Now you just walk it out. That's the easy, that's the easy part mm -hmm. is to just walking it out, but just know that on your way of walking it out, there are going to be these things that try to distract you, get your energy and keep you out of that, uh, out of that mindset and, mm -hmm. and, and knock you basically off balance or off course toward that intention. So the biggest is it, thing is to just 
ignore, just ignore it. Just like when something crazy happens, cause it's going to expect that it will. And he says to activate what he calls your inner guardian. So in Eastern mysticism, this is the, the witness, you know, the, the, the part of you that's paying attention. And as long as you can pay attention and you'll get swept up time and time, all the time. I mean, in traffic or whatever, you know, you'll express some distaste from time to time. It just is what it is. But the more conscious you become of it, the more that you will be able to see those coming. And then you won't, you won't give your energy nearly as much. So you'll keep more of it. So it's just a, it's just a practice. Mm. So, so the practice again, just, just to summarize it for people to understand here is that what we're sort of saying is that when this thing's happening, and again, it's also, I think here, not being, as you sort of mentioned, not being ignorant to it. So if you get some really bad news, like someone's ill, like your parents ill, someone's died, it's not about laughing it off, but it's just understanding that it kind of is what it is and kind of accept that rather than give it more energy than necessarily it desires. Because I think as well, there's that fine line there of like, you don't want to just be laughing your way through the world burning around you. There's <laughs> sure. some sort of point where you kind of got to be like, okay, I've kind of got to deal with this. But what you're saying is like the, the, the big stuff that isn't personal like that. Like for example, all the stuff about World War Three that's kicking off on the news. Okay, just sort of laugh about it. Okay, doing all the political stuff. Okay, laugh about it. Your football team loses, laugh about it. Whatever it is, is these things, your boss says something, laugh about it. Like just, just don't emotionally engage with it. Right. And stay conscious. Because it's when you, it's the emotional engagement of it. It's just like a thought, essentially, isn't it? Like the, the thoughts are neutral, pendulums are neutral. It's only your energy that gives it power. So if you can just observe it, notice, ah, that's what this is. You then don't give it your energy. It therefore can't have the power of you, and you can just actually see it for what it is. Ah, here are the facts. This is what's been said. What am I going to decide to do about it? Is that kind of what we're at here? A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Because you, you can't, you can't change those things anyway. Right. Like, so in order to get all swept up in, in arms about it, it's not going to help your situation at all. So the better, the better thing to do is just accept it. It's not about denial, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is a healthy line there. You know, if you, if someone passes away in your family, of course you should grieve your loss and, and, you know, do the things that you need to do in order to emotionally heal. And those are, you know, those are, that's that's important, but that's outside of you know what we're talking about here. I just, um, want, to clarify, but, I just want to clarify because as soon as you were talking, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I said well, we're covering some deep stuff. So I'm trying to put myself in a in a position of I've never heard this material before, and I don't want people to that's mm -hmm. someone pass away and me be like, oh no, it's fine, it's fine. Like um, Bootsy said, I've got to just be chill and like right. it's, <laughs> ignore it. No, to me, just stay happy, and I've got to laugh about it. It's like no, 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 that, <laughs> that's not what we're saying here. We're not saying laugh about the stuff like that. What we're saying is like, no. what can you control? And stuff like that's a real genuine thing. Like again, grieve, do the emotional support stuff. That again, I think both of us like wholeheartedly um, say, yeah, that's what you've got to be doing. But it's just like actually th this other stuff. It's like you, uh, what can you control? What is in your control? And the only two things you can control are your thoughts and your actions. So it's like, how are you choosing to respond to this situation rather than the natural thing, which the pendulum wants you to do, which is react. Exactly. You want to That's respond so, and not react. So good. So well put. Yeah. 100%. Yep. Yep. One final well I'm, 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 I'm loving this already. Like it's brilliant. So is, is, it, <laughs> is, is it part of this as well when he talks about uh, renting yourself out? Is this, mm -hmm. is this part of how to not let pendulums hook on you? Because this is something that again, one of the main things I took from this book when I first read it was pendulums uh, and renting yourself out. Can you talk about that practice? Because that's a really interesting thing because there'll be a lot of people that listen to this and they are at work surrounded by pendulums and these mood hoovers, these energy vampires. Maybe their mother-in-law is a mood hoover and energy vampire. So how how can we rent ourselves out? That's explained in the book. Like, What is that? What's it look like? And how's that going to help us? Sure. Yeah. That, and that's a great tactic too. You know, that's part of that observer, just being aware that this is what's happening, right? Like these, these things are coming after you to get your energy. I'll give you a, just a personal example. I used to be a bartender and, uh, and I was working in a bar and my bar manager was OCD about like how the bottles were placed on the back of the bar and many other things too. And I used to fight that. I used to like, be like, why is it got it? You know, which did not help me. It didn't endear her toward me anymore. When I would ask for dates off or, you know, help, she would be less inclined to help me. So when I figured this out, I was like, oh, wait, she just wants this thing done a certain way. If I just do it with a smile on my face and, you know, not make a big deal about it, <laughs> then all mm -hmm. of a sudden, 
right? She's more endeared to me. She's more likely to help me when I have a request. And really, you know, everything just runs more smoothly. Like it made my life easier if I would just, you know, comply with that request, right? So you're complying with the pendulum's request, but you're not giving it your energy, right? Like instead of being sucked into it, you're like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's, they want it done this way. Cool. I'll just do it that way. You're not reacting to it. You're not freaking out about it. You're not, you don't have all this pent up anger or aggression about it. You're like, okay, this is the situation that I'm in. I'm just going to rent myself out and do it the way that it's supposed to be done within this, this mechanism, this machine, whatever that do as I do rule is. If you have no choice, but to obey the pendulum rule, which is do as I do, uh, then you just do as you do, but with the least amount of energy. Right. Mm. And so you just basically simply comply with it. You know, it's like, Oh, well, you've got to, you know, take your temperature or whatever. It's like, it's like a red light or a stop sign. It's like, yep. you just, you just stop there and then you keep moving forward. It's just don't, don't, don't give it your emotional energy. So yeah, your emotions, your energy, your time, just, it is, especially like I said, if you're working, your boss told you to do something, it is what it is. Like factually, this is what it is. I, I've got to do it. So you might as well do it. Not putting that negativity out there. Because again, as you mentioned, that's what it wants. It feeds off that negativity. So as you sort of mentioned, you give your energy to your boss, like the anger, that pent up anger, she will then feed off that either intentionally mm -hmm. or unintentionally. And that's why, again, some people genuinely crave off this. And I think this is something to understand. We've all, I think, been in relationships or friendships where people just love conflict. They love yep. to just throw things in the work because they feed off that drama. They love the chaos. They absolutely thrive off that. But that then doesn't serve you, the person that's victim to that. So it's about not making yourself a victim and realizing you have a choice. And again, you're like, oh, I don't have a choice. I've got to do the job. No, you have a choice on how you choose to do that job. Because you can sit there, you can moan under your breath, you can swear at your boss, you can, that's not going to get you anywhere. Or you can decide and choose, I've got to do this. I'm doing it with a smile on my face. So I'm getting paid for it anyway. And then, and like I said, look at the bigger picture of, hopefully I'll get my time off work or whatever it is. So it's a real key differentiator there, but it's, it's not being patronizing about it, is it? Like the smile on your face, like, uh, and they're thinking, what the hell are you smiling at? It's just, just going about your normal business. Don't allow yourself to get hooked into it emotionally and just crack on doing what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. That frees you up too, because now you have more energy to move toward whatever it is that you want. You know, you're like, this is a temporary situation anyway, right? Like if you're working for someone that you don't really want to be working for, or even if you're in a project and it is what you want to be working on, you know, sometimes it's best to just relax and f fight a different battle if you are going to have to fight. But generally speaking, there is a simple solution to almost every complex problem. And whenever we learn how to just gauge our own emotions and not invest and react, like you're saying, be proactive, not reactive to it, then all of a sudden uh, it changes. And if you can change your disposition to the other person, right? Like what do they want? This is the idea in the book. It's called frailing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a weird word, but basically it's like thinking about what the other person wants. So if your boss comes into you and they're like, I need this thing, this report done by such and such or whatever, what is it that they need? Or if you're at a job interview, you know, the interviewer needs a, the best quality candidate. So a lot of us, we're sitting there thinking about why we're so great, but we're not thinking about the needs of the interviewer. If we put ourselves in their position and think about what their needs are, then all of a sudden our answers are going to change a lot from this like, sort of like proud, braggy, you know, kind of perspective into, you know, I'm going to make your life easier. And that shift in perspective is very slight. He even says that you can uh, visualize th the person that you're dealing with having like a great experience. If they love golf, if your boss loves golf, you can just picture them out on the, on the green, sinking a putt or something. Mm -hmm. And that will endear them to you more because you're thinking about them and what it is that they want. Cause everyone is predominantly thinking about themselves. It's mm -hmm. just, it's the nature, you know, we're, we're kind of trapped in these meat sacks anyways. Mm -hmm. So we just have to, you know, kind of think about our own livelihood first and foremost. And everyone is in that very same position. So when we go the other way and think about them, now they think about us as the person who acknowledged their good traits, the things mm -hmm. that, 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 that made their needs easier. And you can see this in a sort of spiritual way too, where it's almost like the invisible hand of like a spiritual market, you know, mm -hmm. what he calls outer intention and giving, giving the things that people need. 
and in do in finding what those things are, you can figure out how to use your own skills to give those things to people, offer those things to people, uh, and and make that a win win situation as opposed to something where you are just looking to gain yourself. When you think about the other person's need, maybe maybe you know you're sitting there across from your boss and he needs a certain project done, and you're like, well, you know, Tim is actually really good at graphing maybe Tim should do this job. He'll be able to, and he's got two days off, you know, two days extra time for work, you know, and then you don't have to do the thing. And the boss is like, yeah, that's a really good idea. Tim is actually excellent at that particular thing. Let's get Tim to do it. But it's because you're thinking about the needs of the other person less than thinking about your own needs, but you can leverage that in a way that everyone wins if you're smart about it. So it's the same in relationships as well, isn't it? I feel yeah. like in relationships, it's, it's Again, I used to just that very subtle shift in perspective of can I put myself in my partner's shoes and see where they're coming from with this? What need are they not having met? So then you can then fulfill that need because then your partner's then happy. And then as a byproduct, your life becomes easier. So you almost kind of not necessarily doing it for a selfish gain, but it's like it's that give and take. It's understanding that actually in that situation, why they're why they acting this way why they're responding this way what is it that they actually need what is it they want and you could put yourself in that shoes and i love what you said there as well it's also if it's someone that you dislike obviously it's not gonna be a partner but let's say it is your boss and you dislike them if you can change the energy you bring to the situation everything changes so as you said if you just envision them winning at golf you just envision them whatever it is being a i don't know supportive charity giver whatever it is rather than this, this horrible person by you just changing your energy towards them the energy towards you changes because all the world is doing is giving a perfect reflection of your attitude towards it. So if you change your attitude towards someone, I say this all the time to clients. Mm. I think this comes from our good friend, Paul Cope. Talks about when someone comes in with fire energy, you don't fight fire with fire, it causes them more fire. But if you can just go at it with water, it changes their fire to water. So you're just changing the energy, you're changing what you bring to that situation, especially if it's kind of like we talk about with pendulums. If you bring a different energy that's unexpected, mm. it throws them off course. Right. So it puts you back in the driver's seat. Am I making sense? I'm trying to make this as, as understandable for the audience that may not have understand any these principles because um, it is a hard concept to get your head around. But once you, you, you practice these things and you see that it works, it's absolutely game changing. Yeah, I think you're doing a great job. I'm trying to not to get in the weeds here because it, it'd be really easy to do it. But just- Oh, mate, you've been studying it... this for like 16 years. I've been doing it for, mate. You, <laughs> well, are, eight. you are eight, is it eight? Eight, eight, yeah, years. eight. Listen, eight years. I mean, that, that is, you, you've been studying this. I, I said this to Katie beforehand. Like Your knowledge on this is is so advanced, which is why, again, I know it's potentially harder for you to, to bring it back to basics, which is just trying to, because you're, you're dropping such gold here. And again, you're doing a great job. I just want to make sure that I'm- using my analogies, which I seem to be good at, to just kind of bring it back down to a thing we can use, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And I'll try to give this in an example where people can kind of see it. Like, uh, let's say in dating or something, if you are pursuing uh, someone and you think they're really cute and attractive or whatever, if I'm, like I'm talking to a cute girl and, uh, and I'm talking about how beautiful she is and how great and all this kind of stuff. And thinking that because if I say those things, then she's going to be more endeared to me and give me what I want, which is a kiss or whatever, right? Uh, well, if I think about it from her perspective, like, what does she really want? She probably wants a fun time, right? Like, so if I riff and play and say some silly things and goof, goof around a little bit, then that's going to actually change the dynamic that's in that moment right like that's what that person really would appreciate right like so maybe i call her the devil and then she laughs like like crazy you know mm -hmm. and thinks that's so funny or whatever well that's that's thinking about it from the other person's perspective what is it that they want out of the interaction they want to have a good time as opposed to what is it that you're trying to get out of the interaction if you give them what they want in the interaction well now all of a sudden they may change their disposition and they may give you what you want without you ever even requesting it she might be like, oh, you're so funny. And then you give me a kiss on the cheek or something, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that may be a superficial example, but like as human beings, like the way that we interact, it's, it's kind of gets weird and formal when we think about trying to get what we want. When we mm -hmm. think about what the other person might want, what would make them happy and excited, right? Instead of, you know, trying to get something from a situation when we learn to give in those situations we automatically get the thing that we wanted very often it happens a lot more and i can give an even more simple example i was at the grocery store one day and uh, there was a lady 
who I would think would be generally, she just seen, she had an aura of bad attitude around her. Let's say she had a full cart of groceries and I was going, my grandmother was still alive at the time. I was going to get my grandmother some grapes and like some candies. Like I had two things in my hand and we both arrived at the, um, at the checkout line at the very same time, you know, and I look at her, she looks at me and I just, I said, go ahead. And then she was like, no, 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 you go ahead. Right. Like I was almost half joking with her to go ahead. Cause look at the absurdity of the mm -hmm. situation. She's got $900 worth of groceries in her cart and I've got some cough drops and a bag of, you know, green grapes. Uh, and, and, and so because I was willing to say, go ahead. Right. If I would have tried to get in front of her, she probably would have been like, I was here first. You mm -hmm. know, she would have mm -hmm. like turned into a Karen. <laughs> but because I, but because I was willing to give the thing that I wanted, it actually turned out that she gave it to me instead. Like that may be a simpler example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it makes, makes perfect sense. And that's the thing it's, and again, people might say this is, is manipulation. It's not manipulation because you're looking out for what that person really wants. So you're not manipulating them to get what you want, really. It's just a byproduct. And again, even if you don't get what you want, if you help other people, you put that positivity out there, it may not come back to you from that person, but it will come back around to you. Does that make sense? So it's not manipulation because we're, we're talking about here from a, from a person to person perspective. It can sound like it's manipulation. Like for the date, for example, I'm just, I'm just thinking in my head that like people are like, oh, it's manipulation. It's not manipulation because you're giving that person what they want. You're not forcing them to do anything in return. And again, you may not, that person maybe I've had a great time, but you're not the kind of guy for me. Okay, but you put the positive energy out there and actually on the bus ride home, you happen to bump into someone that you then go on. I mean, it, 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 the, the, the laws of the universe will always come back. So we're not talking about manipulation here, yeah. but it's also just understanding as well that, and this is why I'm so desperate to get some information out there. Once you understand that the universe has laws and that you understand that people play by these laws and they may not necessarily be playing, playing by them for a positive purpose, you can pull yourself out of the game. You can pull yourself out of the matrix. You can stop yourself from being a non-playable character in a computer game. You can actually take control of your life because this is fundamentally what me and Owen are talking about right now. There are people that are playing in this world by a different set of rules. You do not know the rules. We're trying to help you learn the rules so that you can actually then take control. Because if you look at how politicians talk, for example, it is mass manipulation. The words they're using, like if you actually listen to the words of what they're saying when they're asked a question, they avoid the question. And that's all it is, mass manipulation if you can understand that these games are being played you don't engage your energy with it you can crack on living your life without being knocked off course thinking about what an arsehole that person is i mean is that, is that, is that kind of simple isn't it 100 percent, yeah and it's it's not manipulation it's everyone winning it's yes. instead of you because the other way is actually manipulation when you're yes. trying to get what you want you're being coercive Yes. And you don't even realize it, but that's the standard that's set in reality. So instead of that, you're actually opening up to the universe. And one of the metaphors he uses in the book that's so good is like a fly buzzing against a window pane, trying to get out, trying to get out, trying to get out. And all it would have to do is fly back a little bit in order to see that the window next to it is open and it could fly right out of that window. But we get so caught up and so like we have such a small view of what is going on and especially within the set of the parameters of time is that we want this thing. We want our Oompa Loompa now or whatever. <laughs> and we're trying to force it. We're trying to coerce it, but it's like, that's like trying to pick up water. It's like every one of our most basic needs to be able to control reality, but we just don't have the right video game controller in our hands. Like we're trying to play with a bag of potato chips and there's a video controller like right over there that we could just press the A button or the B button, you know, on it and get the thing that we want. But because we are so accustomed to and so used to the way people interact and do things in the world that we now see what is selfless as selfish. It's yep. the complete opposite. Couldn't be more. So let's talk about, because you kind of touched on it a second ago. Uh, I say a second ago, it's probably about 30 minutes ago, about <laughs> intention. So um, can we talk about these two concepts of inner intention versus outer mm -hmm. intention and what making the distinction between the two means yeah so uh, intention inner intention and outer intention um are two very different things inner intention really has to do with what we know as it's not exactly desire but it's very similar to desire and desire can oftentimes kind of get in our way that's one of the things that i think loa uh kind of misses is that when we fantasize and over fantasize and you know and, and obsess about something it actually creates resistance 
toward us getting to whatever that thing is. Why? And the reason why is because it it is like a, an emotional weather system. It's it, he the author calls it importance. So we've attached so much importance to what that thing is. And you hear people talk a lot about putting things on a pedestal or putting people on a pedestal. As soon as we do that, we can, we've taken ourselves out of the running for it. We are now no longer worthy. You know, it's like Wayne and Garth, you know, we're not worthy, right? Like, and then Alice Cooper's like, dude, you're worthy. Just stop doing that. You're making me feel weird, bro. And that's how the universe feels, right? Like we put ourselves down into this position where it's like, oh, if I could just have this one thing, then everything would be great. And that would make my life happy, you know, and I'm going to fantasize about it and, and overemphasize it. Think about stage fright going on stage. If you overthink a speech or if you overthink a performance, the more you get in your head, the worse it's going to be when you get on that stage. That is mm -hmm. what importance is. And so we're kind of like making these emotional contracts with the universe by doing those things. So inner intention is really about kind of what we were talking about before, like trying to get someone to do something, a lot of coercion, a lot of pushiness, manipulation, as opposed to outer intention, which we kind of were talking about this when I said frailing is frailing is kind of like a one-on-one -on -one version of what outer intention would be. Mm -hmm. now, outer intention is kind of like, how can I serve the world? What does the world need? You know, what, uh, what can, what can I do to help, you know, um, a, a, the, the universe at large, you know, and, and bring my skills to that, uh, that particular realm and, and do that. So outer intention is really what magic is when people talk about magic and they talk about, you know, doing rituals to create things, um, outer intention is that force that is magic or synchronicity or, you know, uh, the way God works in mysterious ways or whatever. That's how the author defines outer intention. And inner intention is usually us getting in our own way, whereas outer intention is generally speaking, that's whenever the universe is basically delivering us what it is that we've ordered without a lot of extra work on our part. It doesn't mean that we don't do things to get there and take those necessary steps and actions in order to fulfill our goal or our request to the universe but outer intention sort of delivers it. And it always does it in sort of a different way. Like our mind is kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything negative about the mind because the mind is awesome. It's a very important thing, but inner intention comes from this egoic place and outer intention comes from this, I would say like more selfless and open place. Um, when we're, when we're trying to get something, we're thinking of ways to get it. We're making strategies. We're thinking, oh, if I talk to Daniel, then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be able to get in touch with Paul and he'll do this thing for me. So we have this like linear, linear sort of progression of ideas of how things can unfold, but outer intention delivers it in a way that's always unexpected and never some, some way that we could really plan for. Mm. And that's the sort of magic. It's sort of the magic, uh, yeah, the, like, I guess, I guess just like the, yeah, the magic power of, uh, of outer intention is, is how intention, true intention is, is fulfilled. So just to clarify with this, because this is, this is a, a subject matter for me where I want clarity on this. This is, again, I'm not speaking for myself in the audience shoes. This is me trying to understand this as well. So my understanding of this then is the inner intention is, uh, let's say I want to have this thing. And I know that if I talk to you, you can get me that thing. So let's say, for example, a podcast guest, let's say that I happen to know that you've interviewed someone and I'm like, right, if I get Owen on my podcast to talk about something like that, I know he'll talk about, great, so I've got that. And then afterwards I'm saying, right, Owen, can I get in there with that person? That's like me trying to force it and be like, right, I've got this goal, this outcome and forcing the outcome. Whereas actually if my, um, out, my outer intention is I want to have a really amazing podcast, mm -hmm. I've got Owen on. I'm just gonna do the best podcast I possibly can with Owen, and then at the end of it, you'll be like, "Oh, so actually, I've got this guest that." So it's like I kind of I, I've lined up that I want this thing, and I've I think the key thing is the feeling behind it. Like my intention with the outer one is that I am emotionally involved in it in a positive way. Like um, it's like I, I want this on my heart. This is what I want. However, I'm not going to force it. I'm just going to show up and serve Owen right now and make sure that, again, he feels welcome on this podcast, make sure I give him time to talk, have a great debrief afterwards. And then after we finish this thing, cool. I then carry on going about my business, make sure Mike is okay, looked after, make sure he's had a drink and carry on going about my life. And then you're going to somehow contact me to like, oh, I've got this thing that's going to help me. And the universe will kind of provide to get me what I want. Is that kind of how it is? Where if I try and force it, 
you're right. going to smell that and be like, oh, hell no. But if I just kind of just talk to you like a normal human being and put good energy and intention out there, the universe will then provide, maybe not necessarily through you, but in some other way, it will guide me the right steps to get that thing I want. Is that it? I think so. Yeah. Cause like desperation is a stinky cologne, you know, mm -hmm. like people notice that right off the rip. But, um, but I also would just add a caveat to say that there's nothing wrong with um, taking a request to sometimes some, one of the things that I've kind of done and I've just been like, well, I just won't ask, but it's okay to ask, but maybe offer something first, right? Like, so with the outer intention. So, um, so for instance, I'll give you an example. I have some dates where I'm looking to book because I'm going to Texas and, and back and all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to go through New Orleans. I've got some dates there and Texas and blah, blah, blah. So I recently reached out to a comedy producer in Florida and I said, hey, I would love to have a group of Panama City comedians come up and do kind of a takeover show here in Athens where I have a couple of uh, rooms. I think it'd be a really fun show and it'd be awesome. And also I'll be in Panama City these dates. So I'm looking for some shows there. So I didn't just hit him up and ask him for something, right? Like I hit him up and said, hey, if a group of y'all want to come up, we'd love to have you. I think it'd be super fun. I'm offering something. And then I'm also asking as well, you know, on the, on the back end. So that's definitely better than just asking. And sometimes though, it's okay to just ask, you know, I have people hit me up too, like from a booker percent, uh, perspective. And this is something that keep in mind is like, I need comedians. I need comedians to book. So if you're a good comedian and you reach out to me and you say, Hey, I'm going to be in Athens such and such a day. If you have anything, that'd be great. Let me know. That takes, that takes pressure off me. I like you for it. I'm like, Oh, thank God. Like, I, I don't have to worry about booking this date. I got, you know, Zane Lamprey coming through or whomever. And it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt to to reach out and, and just and just ask and make the request. That's something that I feel like I've gotten in my own way a lot mm -hmm. about. I've been like, oh, I'm going to do this great thing for these people and the universe will compensate me in its own way. And there's nothing wrong with that as a uh, as an outlook. That is the correct disposition to have because the world will take care of you. Mm -hmm. But also, if there is a thing that you uh, are looking for in the moment, um, you, you can simply ask. Don't feel bad about it. Just don't feel guilty about it. I think that's a lot of times what it is. It's like, you, that's where that thirst comes from. It's like, why don't you feel like you deserve it? Like, mm -hmm. just ask, uh, you know, th there's one analogy that he talks about is when Russia fell from being like a, the, the communist country that it was. And all these people were billionaires overnight, just because they allowed themselves to have, they allowed themselves to take the uh, possession of certain things that were part of the public's you know, ownership, but then it became private. So they just like, were like, Oh, well, I, that's mine now. You know what I mean? And without any, without any, uh, excitement or exacerbation or, you know, high emotions or freaking out, they were just like, Nope, uh, these are my tanks or these are my, this is my car dealership. Or, you know, from my perspective, like this is my comedy room. And I, you know, that door recently opened up to me and it wasn't something that I ever expected. I was trying to serve the muse of comedy, which sounds really, really cheesy. But honestly, like that was my disposition is like, I know that if I serve comedy, then comedy will comedy itself as a goddess, as a art form, whatever, however you want to visualize that will serve me. So all of a sudden I just had doors open up to me and I had two, three, four rooms, all these different rooms that I have, you know, now as a, as a, as a comedy producer, just by opening up an Instagram account and basically doing a comedy bulletin board. I knew mm -hmm. people wanted to come to comedy shows. I knew there were comedians that wanted to have opportunities and do open mics. So I started putting those things out in our local community here. And now that Instagram has 13,000 followers and the rooms that I run are generally close to sold out. Uh, and I just had a article written about me in one of the local papers and another one that's about to come out. So, you know, it's, that was from me saying, what does the community need? What can mm -hmm. I do? How can I leverage my skills, my desire, my intention to be a comedian, which I didn't really want to be a producer per se, right? Like I just want to get booked. I want to mm -hmm. go to other places, but the more I provide opportunities for other people, when I hit up so-and-so in Austin who runs such and such room. And I'm like, hey, they already know who I am. They're like, we'd yeah. love to have you. I don't, we don't, don't even send your press kit. We, we can't wait, but, but uh, we can't wait to meet you. And that's the thing as well. And I'm really glad you sort of touched this as well. It's because once you know kind of where you're going, 
doors will open up to you and it's not rude to walk through the door. And then it's also, if the doors don't open up to themselves, I said right now, what's my intention behind asking you? So if I'm going to say to you, Owen, do you have any friends that are on thing? If my intention is to, I don't know, steal that friend from you and I don't know, <laughs> but if my intention is I'm trying to put some good content out there that's helping people that are struggling mentally and I'm putting that intention out there by asking you that question, th there's good behind it. Do you know I mean? I'm not being selfish about my needs. If I'm not doing it for any other reason than Owen's well connected, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's a, the, the fine line of, yeah, ask, like always ask, but what's your intention behind asking? Like, is there good behind it? Because if there is, the universe will do it. And again, if you're just walking the path, which I think is where law of attraction kind of goes wrong, you can't just think and visualize this stuff. You have to actually walk the path. And as you're walking the path, the universe will have these doors, open the door go through the door it's been put there for a reason don't be afraid of knocking don't be afraid of going in i think that's a, a key thing people think oh that's not for me it's there for a reason you're seeing it for a reason knock you never know what's on either side of it allow yourself allow yourself to 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 have you know you deserve the best absolutely 100 percent uh, Owen, is there anything else you wanted to touch on about Red Strand Surfing? That we, again, it's such a massive book. It's like a thousand pages, I would say. <laughs> yes. We've gone over some of the key things I want to talk about, which is the pendulums, letting go of the, the intention, which is a big, big thing. But is there any, any final comments you want to say for people that may be wanting to dabble on this? I'm going to plug your thing in a second, but from an actual concept perspective, is there anything else you wanted to cover or talk about? It's, it's hard because I could really talk about this a lot and I hope we didn't go too off topic because there, there really is so many, so much nuance to this. You know, I'm trying to explain a lot of these ideas as much as I possibly can on my YouTube channel in more depth because, you know, that way, if you're hungry for, you know, deeper, more nuanced knowledge on the subject, then it, it, it exists. Um, but I, I guess I would say that really where intention is born is through the connection of heart and mind. And so what we want to do is we want to let our heart lead us and listen to what our heart has to say. And our heart speaks to us in a very quiet whisper that he calls the rustle of the morning stars. And our mind has to hear that. Now, if you look at the tarot card, the lovers, you see that tarot card, there is a feminine angel looking up at God. And then there's a masculine man looking at that angel. That angel gets information directly from source. And that masculine mind, that's the feminine is the heart. The masculine is the mind. That's the man that's keying off of that heart. So that is how, that is how creative works are born. That is how to manifest whatever it is that you're trying to create in, in the world. It's about heart and mind connection. That's no different than any other esoteric book, any other esoteric text. You know, the six pointed star is the chalice and the phallus, the masculine and feminine. It's the union of the opposites. That is everything that is esoteric literature, manifestation, et cetera, so on and on. So take the time to listen to your inner voice, the, that, that quiet whisper that's within you. He says that to love your heart with all your mind, allow your heart to take control. And then the mind can be a great co-pilot, but the mind is the co-pilot. It's not in control. It shouldn't be in control. Mm -hmm. And when you let the mind get into control, it's going to shove your heart into a box. And then you're not going to get that toy that your heart wants. Like the heart is like a little girl that is in a toy store. And they're like, I want this thing. And the mind's like leading it around. Like, well, that's not for us. You know, allow yourself. If you have a desire that is, because he says this later on in the book, and this is a little woo woo or whatever, but who cares? Rumi said, you're not the entire, or you're not an ocean. You're not a drop in the ocean. You were the entire ocean in a drop. Mm -hmm. Every desire that you have is from source itself. Allow yourself to fulfill that desire. Mm -hmm. Love your heart with all your mind and, and then put those things together. Allow your heart to lead you, you because your dream is the dream of God. Mm -hmm. It's the same. They're synonymous. Uh, and the source as well. Are we using that as this uh, universal energy? Is that another hundred percent? Yeah, so, so just, just clarify, it's another word for it. Cause that's, that's how I learned. I learned it's universal energy and source. So I to make sure that again, there's not another word source that I'm not aware of. I'm like, oh, it's another thing I need to learn. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so, so, so I think for me, yeah, like I said, it, it, I'm really glad you said that because it's again, you've got the conscious mind, the subconscious mind. And again, subconscious mind, again, the heart. Uh, and that's not how I was taught it but I was taught that the heart is very feeling based. So the subconscious feeling based, and obviously the heart feeling based. So again, it all makes sense when I tie it all together. And it's understanding that 96 to 98% of the results that we get in our life are on a subconscious level. Hmm. 
So just understanding that to tap into those subconscious desires and wants and actually look at the results you're getting in your life because the results that you're getting in your life are a direct reflection of your subconscious programming. So it's understanding if you don't have the results in your life, you then have to become aware of what the hell is going on here and then change it. So um, I just want to do a show. I'm, I, again, I'm not going to get into do it. I'm going to do it myself because I think it might hold more, more weight validity of my audience because I never, ever push or sell anything on here. Um, Owen has released a summary guide of this reality transurfing. And I only bought it last night. And I've already gone through quite a substantial amount of it to prepare for this podcast. I have never seen such a fantastic work of art on this. And I've paid for a course through someone that we're not going to mention um, for this book. And Owens is substantially better. And I'm not saying that because Owen is my friend. I said to him off air that if it wasn't good, I would have told him. Um, his summary of the chapters, his summary and understanding of this work is absolutely second to none. So if you want to understand any more about this, if you're in the UK, it'll cost you £20 to get the audio book and his PDF summary of all the chapters. I strongly recommend if you're going to read this book, get the audio and or the PDF as well to go along with it because I promise you it will help you substantially. And this is how I met Owen originally as Boatsy because I saw his YouTube summaries and I was basically reading the sum reading the book and watching his summaries. This guy knows what he's talking about. I basically made him really dumb it down today, but I promise you if you're looking to learn more about reality transurfing, Owen is your man. I get no money, no kickback from me and uh, endorsing this. I'm just telling you because he's a very, very genuine, kind-hearted man and his work is exceptional so go and check that out i'll put the links in the description but that's my plug for you mate like i said i, I said i don't wow. want you to have to do it yourself i just want to do it for you because genuinely as i said to you when i voice knowed you i was blown away i listened to the first two chapters and i was like mate this is incredible it's so succinct the audio chapter is about seven minutes eight minutes and it's really easy to digest and it's just fantastic so go and check that out Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's a, it's a huge compliment coming from you, Daniel. I, I can't thank you enough. No, listen, my audience will know that I don't blog people's stuff most of the time because I don't use it and I haven't used it. So I'm not going to sit <laughs> and be like, oh yeah, go and buy this person's course or this book because I've not read right. it. And if I have read it, I'll, 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 I'll push it and say it's a good book. But most of the time I haven't read it. But for you, it's like, no, genuinely, it's fantastic. So uh, where can people connect with you? And obviously the website, but where on your Instagram, where can people find out more about you? Sure. I am Bootsy Greenwood all over the place. That's my stripper name, just in case people need to know. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so if you're looking for a metaphysical education and a little bit of fun late night, no, I'm kidding, but, <laughs> but no, uh, uh, BootsyGreenwood.com. I'm Bootsy Greenwood on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube. And I just started a new series with my good friend, Abby Johnson, who... Man, talk about a transformation. She is a bodybuilder now, uh, but she and I both have been really following along the concepts of trans surfing over the past several years. We've been friends for several years. She's an incredible, incredibly talented person, very smart and, uh, and, a, and a lucid dreaming coach, as well as a, a personal trainer and many other things. Um, so she and I are talking about these concepts on my YouTube channel and on my podcast. The podcast is called Blue Collar Mystics. So you can find that on all the platforms. And yeah, um, yeah, bootsygreenwood.com. And that should have all the links for basically everywhere else. And I want to thank you so much, everybody who listened. Thank you so much, Daniel, for having me on your show. Dude, it was a pleasure. I'm super honored and grateful to have you as a friend. Man, always a pleasure, mate. And I look forward to chatting with you soon. Awesome. Likewise.